hello everyone. Happy, what is it, Tuesday? <laughs> I think it's Tuesday. <laughs> hey everyone. Uh, let us know if you can see and hear us okay, how your day's going, where you're tuning in from in the world. Um, today I am joined by the one and only Dan McKenzie to talk about male vulnerability, a favorite topic in the group, really. I wish I was the one and only Dan McKenzie. It turns out I keep my emails all have a Y at the end because there's some other Dan McKenzie out there or Daniel who keeps getting all the email addresses. Oh, but that's so funny. The nevertheless. <laughs> I don't really have that trouble with my name. It's a little more unusual. Um, cool. Yeah. Hey, everyone. Happy Tuesday. Let us know how your day's getting on, where you are in the world, what's up for you, what's on your mind today. We'll start in a moment. I see folks trickling in. Let us know if the sound is good and you can hear and see us okay. Um, Dan, any highlights from your day so far? Well, um, you know, every morning is an adventure. I have a little uh, two-year-old. I almost said one-year-old. It's going to be two in just about a month and a half. And so that there's always something new. In <laughs> He's learned to say the word blue. He was always saying blah, blah, blah. And this morning I said, can you say blue? And he said, blue. <laughs> They're like, wow, that was, that's big. So, and the funny thing was, then he goes, pop, pop, because he, he has a problem with ooh. And, and when we try to say, do you have a poop? He's always like, pop, pop. So he's trying to, the minute he got blue, he was like, I'm going to try poop now. Right, and, right. That's wow. the highlight. That's a, that's a massive highlight. Master so, yeah, <laughs> you know, it's kind of important in life. If you think about it, ooh, is a good one. You that's, know? A, that's a really good one. Yeah, mm -hmm. there's all kinds of stuff you can say with yeah. that. Um, yeah. I was listening to a really interesting Brene Brown podcast yesterday where she was talking with an expert in neuroscience from Stanford. Mm. And they were talking about like human development is so fascinating. There are certain windows where you can achieve certain, like very specific skills like language or like um, trying to think of some of the other things like cognition around certain things. Mm -hmm. um, and as you get older, they're more like refined skills that you can learn at any time. Um, mm -hmm. But like when it comes to certain things like language, there's like a very small window, you know, between, I don't know, ages probably like one and three. Um, I, let me know if any child development people, if I'm like way off, but that's like what I'm assuming. Um, and it was, yeah, it was just super interesting to hear. They've done some studies with like kids who have been neglected in their childhood years and how they're never able to pick up those skills. Like, you know, their parents locked them in a closet and basically gave them food and water and that's it. Um, and, and yet their skills as adults that we can like really master no matter what the age and talking about like neuroplasticity, it was super fascinating. Um, hey, heavy in like two seconds, like, you know, cause it is. True. Like I'm thinking, well, this kid is anything he's going to suffer. It's certainly not neglect, you know, but there are, it is tragic how some, some children do not, uh, not only don't get enough love, but really uh, suffer abuse. And, and that if, the fact that it affects us developmentally is almost an extreme version of what we'll probably be getting into because all of the cultural influences, including our, our family circumstances affect how men uh, become and navigate their way through life. So we have these extremes of children being neglected or abused, but but in a way, we're all carrying something from something that wasn't done quite right in our youth. Yeah, and when I was listening to that interview, I was really thinking about the students that I worked with in another life when I was a high school teacher. Um, I actually taught at the high school that Jennifer Hudson went to, if you know the singer. Um, yeah. So on the south side of Chicago, and you know, the majority of my students, everyone was on free and reduced lunch. It was a pretty much 100% African American school, and every single kid was going through just like the toughest of challenges. You know, the challenges of poverty and homelessness and uh, all the things related to those. Um, and so, not only were they facing those obstacles, but a lot of them, um, because of like family circumstances, like weren't getting attention to language and reading and, and learning in those early years, then it had this ripple effect. I got them in high school. And so I saw like the impact of that ripple effect. So um, yeah, just so fascinating. Um, the way that our family experiences 
have just this everlasting impact on us. And that's kind of what we're diving into today. Um, before we get started, do you want to share just a little bit about who you are and the work that you do? Sure. Interesting place to start. So I have, you know, this whole other life I have has been as, as a musician, as a composer. Um, you know, I started out like any young uh, musician wanting to be a rock star and I was in bands and had record deals. And um, but I always had uh, a, a really uh, deep interest in spirituality and self-development. I wasn't raised in a particularly religious environment, nor am I particularly re religious now. But um, no, I always uh, sensed there was more to the world than meets the eye. And I also, um, I had a bit of a, I don't want to, you know, ha since you've just shared about dealing with kids, inner city kids that really grow up with challenging circumstances, I want to, you know, place this in some perspective, my own suffering. But I did uh, spend six years, uh, I lived in Germany and my mother had married a, a very uh, strict and, and I would say psychologically uh, harsh if you know if not abusive uh, uh stepfather and so there was some um definite aftermath of that that i needed to heal from and i think partly what drew me into self-development was um feeling e even in my early 20s really haunted by that experience i'd have these nightmares about you know having being in a knife fight with my stepfather and i oh. thought to myself i need to heal some of this stuff and that's how i got into self-development work and and uh, pretty early on in my early 20s i discovered uh, Anthroposophy, the work of Rudolf Steiner. And so um, that, that a lot of people don't know who that is, except for maybe if you know about the Waldorf schools, people mm -hmm. are familiar with those very. So, um, and so that was kind of, I, I studied everything uh, from, you know, Eastern religion and Zen and yoga meditation, but Anthroposophy was always kind of a focus. It just sort of was my spiritual home. Later on, I really got into studying nonviolent communication I did a lot of develop self-developmental work with people out here in Los Angeles, and particularly in my 30s, a wonderful woman named Mary Rokamora. Um, did some courses with a guy named Brett Costin. These are people that sort of come out of the Est world a little bit in some way or another. Um, I love Eckhart Tolle and Marianne, Marianne Williamson, and um, in the work of uh, realm of relationships, I just I think Esther and uh, people like Dan Savage are kind of like at the at the forefront. So I'm always studying, always learning. But uh, somewhere along the line, about 10 years ago, I began kind of uh, gestating all the stuff I had taken in and wanting to sort of, uh, sounds vainglorious to say give back, but I started co-hosting meditation groups at the Anthroposophical Center in New York, where I was on the council for many years. And I gave some presentations there about nonviolent communication. And that sort of led to um, people sort of asking me to counsel their child or counsel them through a... Uh, a, a breakup of a marriage. And so I sort of fell into the personal counseling a little bit. Um, and that has sort of expanded. I'm sort of like had a sort of semi, you know, private referral personal counseling thing going on. And that's continued here. Um, and, uh, you know, it's been an interesting experience to help people to mediate the breakup of a business between friends or to help people through uh, a separation to help people with their dating lives. And so that's been kind of my. Uh, I would call cross training for the for for the writing that I've been doing, and now for the Omega Male stuff. So I don't want to prattle on too long about it. But that's sort of me in a nutshell. Um, I know that this is a bit of a tangent, but I'm a very tangential person. Okay. Um, what do you think attracted your mom to your stepfather? Oh, that's a good. That's a, I love this stuff. I'll just dive right in. <laughs> um, well, my mother. And father had a relationship that has been very well captured in in TV and film. If you look at Revolutionary Road, the, the uh, movie with Leonardo DiCaprio and I think it was Kate Winslet, um, or The Ice Storm, you know, it was, uh, or even Mad Men. My dad started out as sort of Mad Men, the guy, sort of three martini lunches, having sex with the secretary, power dynamic imbalances, and my mother, uh, you know, was a very well educated woman who was sort of part of the second wave of feminism. She went to Smith College, and yet she found herself, because of her and my father's preppy backgrounds, living in a suburban home, you know, without a career, even though she was fully qualified to, to get a career. And I think she felt trapped, like those characters in those movies. And then uh, when, we, when she met my stepfather, he was this European 
you know, sort of dashing guy. I think she sort of envisioned him as like uh, the the character from uh, uh, now I'm now I'm blanking on the, the Russian movie uh, with uh, Omar Sharif. But you know, he was sort of like this exotic man, yeah, uh, who was romantic and swept her off her, her feet, and he was married to, and they had this exciting affair. So I think it was kind of like a probably you know people don't usually talk this way about their mother, but I think it was a sexual excitement kind of attraction, and I think it didn't have much to do with who he might be as a as a future parent to her children, and that yeah. we realized that, yeah. uh, you know, in the aftermath. Yeah, Super but it was an escape, really an escape from yeah. just feeling trapped in this very. It's sort of like, uh, you know, not far from the the Betty Friedan work, or you know, the, the, the situations that are, that came out of the fifties and continued into the sixties and seventies, where women yeah. just felt disenfranchised. Yeah, that sense of aliveness that Esther talks about. That's often entangled in an affair. Yeah. Um, yeah. Super interesting. Um, okay, so switching gears. Um, so this morning I was actually chatting with a male group member. Um, he was actually a friend of mine from college, but he's now in the group. Um, and just for context, he's in his early 40s. And um, I asked him if he was gonna join this today. And he said, great topic although I'm probably too comfortable with being vulnerable at times, probably need better breaks, honestly. I know it doesn't feel like that to me because it's always been at the core of who I am, but for the most part, or sorry, core of who I am for the most part. But I think that I am that way. Um, and I really struggle around people who are so uncomfortable with vulnerability. I feel a little bit like an alien. And to be honest, um, like even people who don't make eye contact in the elevator or say hello in the elevator, all of that requires some vulnerability. Mm -hmm. Let's face it, some partners can't take vulnerability from their partner. They prefer to pretend like it doesn't exist. Um, and I just don't have real connection without vulnerability. So I just thought that that was such uh, an interesting starting point for us. Mm. And I'm curious, what are some of the most common shares that you hear from men about the challenges of vulnerability? And does this echo them at all? Well, that's, that's an interesting question because I don't wanna misinterpret what he said, but it sounds like his response was, I don't wanna do this because I'm so comfortable with vulnerability. He was like, saying, he was yeah. saying, uh, vulnerability has always been like a huge part of who I am. It's actually yeah. something I feel really comfortable with, maybe even a little bit too comfortable because people can't meet me in my vulnerability. And so I often feel like an alien. So maybe I'd be better off being a little less vulnerable. That's how I interpreted it. Interesting. So he was like, uh, this is not what I need. He thinks he was he was sort of putting putting the expectation on this is going to be about just treat, teaching men to be vulnerable. And if you're already vulnerable to a fault, right, which is what he seems to be saying, you better not venture into that group because you might get more vulnerable and then have more trouble in the elevator. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I'm just making light of it a little bit, but I, I understand what he's saying, but in a way it is, you know, it's interesting how many obstacles we create for ourselves just unconsciously. And I don't, I don't, I'm not trying to be mean towards your friend, but this is how the ego sort of works, you know, like um, we create obstacles in our own uh, opportunities to our own opportunities for, for growth and learning. You know, I did, a, I did a, an episode of the Omega Males, you know, which you kindly shared about porn. And it's like so many people, the statistics are staggering how many men look at porn and how many women think of porn in their relationship as a problematic issue. And yet that conversation, like there were a lot of people that, oh, couldn't show up or didn't want to show up or didn't want to speak or showed up but didn't speak. It's like there's so much, uh, there's so much um, fertile ground and yet so many ways to just go like, oh, you know, ah, you know, and that's part of his vulnerability that I think he's showing, you know, and what a wonderful voice he would be in this conversation or wonder, wonderful person to have in this to, to share about the experience of being a man and feeling too vulnerable. Because for me, it's not about like men are all not vulnerable enough. Certainly there are trends like that. Yeah. It's more about like, we all have imbalances and some imbalances are cultural, so they're more pervasive and they're more universal. Um, 
But as you and I were sort of chatting about casually, it's not about like just becoming this, tearing yourself open, becoming this hopelessly vulnerable person. It's about finding balance. Mm -hmm. And so when there's a cultural imbalance for men not embracing, not learning what vulnerability is or how to do it, uh, it's useful to learn it. It doesn't mean we have to sort of, there's like a gauge that we're on and like, if I drink more vulnerability, I'm gonna have too, way too much, way too much. I think hopefully this conversation and, and conversations like this will help people gauge what it is and, and how to find kind of an inner parameter, a barometer of balance. So yeah. does that make sense? Yeah, it totally makes sense to me. And I guess the way I see it is like, if someone can't meet us in our vulnerability, whether it's something as simple as like making eye contact and saying hello in an elevator, um, or something as deep as like sharing vulnerability with uh, a romantic partner. To me, I never personalize it. It's just an indication of where the other person is at. And so maybe I step back from that relationship or maybe I stop trying to engage with the person in the elevator. I think there is so much personalization in our culture where, um, oh God, there's this great, I love Cory Booker. And there's this great Cory Booker quote from his book, um, United. I'm gonna butcher it. It's from his dad. And it's something like, don't, don't be a thermometer reflecting the temperature in the room. Uh, be the thermostat and set it. Something along it. those lines. It. Yeah, it's that yeah. same idea. And I don't want to turn down or miss the opportunity to actually speak to what he was saying, you know, rather than just evaluate, you know, why he was or wasn't joining. And, and what you're pointing out is really, uh, I think is really key because yes, let's go with the, the, the elevator example, or it's like you're passing someone on a hiking trail and you say, good morning. And sometimes people are shocked by that. Sometimes you, 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 because in this, it, when you do that, you're actually have a great chance to be the thermostat, right? Because the, the normal temperatures might be just cool. We're passing, we're strangers. When one person says, um, is vulnerable and says, good morning, yeah, right? It's vulnerable because the other person might just look, give you a dirty look and be like, what are you, why are you talking to me, freak? But there is also the opportunity that they might go, oh, oh, good morning to you, you know? And you've raised the temperature as the thermostat. And and then it was, and so it was worth that tiny risk, you know? Yeah. It's worth the tiny risk to say something to someone in the elevator. But if you personalize it, right, if you then if you don't get the desired response and the person in the elevator just sort of shuffles off or the person passing you on the hiking trail, you know, seems uh, disgruntled or whatever. And you say, like, well, what a jerk, you know, here I am being a good person, greeting them. Then really, you did it for yourself. It wasn't a gift of love. You know, it wasn't because the, the, the key to that Corey thing. And I think he really exemplifies this to me as a, as a person is. Uh, it's coming from a place of wanting to give and uh, and give selflessly. You're doing a great benefit to everyone just to to be kind. And if you're not met in that, it's okay. Well, maybe that person has something on their mind. You know, yeah. you personalize it, right? It's right. then it's about you suddenly. It's not about the subjective human humanitarian love. It's about yeah. your selfish want, needing to validate kind of love. Yeah. The way I see it is like, let's say I do take a risk and like try to start strike up a conversation and it's totally not received. The way that I frame it is like, okay, the next time there's an opportunity to have a conversation, like I'll be ready, you know, versus, oh, I should never do that again. Look at what happens. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, you know, that so much has to do with, uh, sadly, with uh, so many factors, our childhood trauma, you know what I mean? Like if it's, if you are have unprocessed trauma from being rejected as a child and you make an overture towards someone, a, a, a warm overture that gets rejected and that triggers the pain, then you're more likely to be the person who says, oh, uh, I, maybe I shouldn't do that again. You know, that's just like that hurts the way it did when I was a child, you know, and that's why I feel like sort of spiritual self-development work is so crucial because all of the things that we carry, I don't want to just call it all childhood trauma, but that's just sort of like a catch-all phrase. Right. Who knows, it your karmic baggage that you're carrying, your, your, your personal disposition, your temperament. But the more we endeavor to kind of find balance and find healing, because we're all, in some way, we're all walking wounded, right? There's not a human being that's yeah. not carrying some hurt. Or, uh, but the more we endeavor to, to heal and balance, the less filters that we receive things through. Are, you know, I mean, because it's coming through a filter. Someone who's really damaged can can 
turn your hello, good morning into a, some kind of attack. Why are you talking to me, you know? Right, right. So there's, there's work that only you can do in a way that each 100%. one of us can do. 100%. Um, and kind of on that topic of the experiences we have and the undoing of them, um, I wanted to share a couple nuggets from Esther's 2018 Masculinity Paradox event. Mm. Um, I know some of you attended it and others of you have seen the YouTube playlist that she created. Um, but this will kind of frame the conversation that we're gonna have today about some of the challenges that my friend brought up um, and that we talk about in our community. Um, so Esther kicked off this event saying, in many ways, it's hard to know what it means to be a man these days. Vulnerability is seen as weakness and feminine. It's also a loss of power and control. Under patriarchy, you can be connected or powerful, but you can't be both. Dan, would you agree with that? Under Absolutely. Patriarchy. Absolutely. And, and I think that's one of the most striking things about that statement is the implication that patriarchy is not great for men, right? I mean, we all kind of talk about patriarchy and some people, it's a very volatile thing. I know a lot of men were like, oh, you're not gonna tell me about patriarchy. And uh, sadly, my dad is among those people. He's a wonderful man and very liberal and progressive in some ways. But I, just last summer he said, oh, don't, oh, you know, now you're gonna tell me about male privilege, I suppose, you know? Um, and so we're used to sort of a hot button issue. It's usually considered like this feminine, feminist term right, the sort of anti-male, but what Esther's introducing here is the idea that patriarchy is bad for everyone. Yeah. That's not, that's not a common observation, and it, and it is. And I think, uh, and I would add to that, um, that patriarchy is built on the notion of, of what I would call, uh, this is a term I didn't invent, but I think it's been bumping around, dominance hierarchies. It's actually something that Jordan Peterson uh, uh, talks about a lot. I, I, I have to always quote him by saying, uh, I think he's a very smart man and I, I disagree with a good part of what he says, but this, and, and I specifically disagree with what he says about dominance hierarchies, but I love that he's introduced that into the conversation because patriarchy has an inherent dominance hierarchy aspect to it. And men suffer under that as much as women do. They suffer in different ways and not to diminish how women have been marginalized under patriarchy, but all this to say that it uh, it is unhealthy and detrimental to men, patriarchal systems. And we can get into that a little bit more if you want to. What do you think is the greatest way that men suffer under patriarchy? Uh, well, along the lines of what I was just setting up uh, is, for one thing, men are subject to uh, an inherent sense of competition with each other, right? And um, patriarchy is about dominance, you know? And it's not just like that men are in control. There's always a man in control of all the other men, as well as, you know, there's, a, there's always a, it's a vertical integration of power. Mm -hmm. um, what I'm interested in, what I think part of my inspiration in working in this field is turning a vertical into a, a horizontal and so that uh, competition is replaced with this in an inherent sense of cooperation collaboration these are things that men are not taught right. men are compete with each other to dominate each other to always be invulnerable and uh and we are it's clear that we're struggling with it you see it so much in in our in our culture and i love this about hollywood people talk about liberal hollywood but uh, I, I literally had a dream last night, and I think it was in anticipation of this conversation. And in the dream, I, was, I, I started thinking about The Mandalorian. And this is sort of a random thing to mention. It's like the new Star Wars series. Mm -hmm. This is like, I'm asleep and I'm having these philosophical thoughts. And I'm like, this is, this, is a, this is a journey of like the atavistic masculinity trying to find a new expression, right? This is a guy whose entire species, man Delorean, what's Delorean in, in Latin? Uh, Dolor, dolor is pain, right? It's like, so he's the suffering man and their whole, they're known for being the baddest ass fighters in the universe. Like that's their, their trade is fighting people, you know, violence. And, and they're also known for having the best armor. It's like, oh, you've got the best car armor. And he actually does these 
jobs to get more of this valuable armor so he can cover himself in the best armor. Like this is literally the opposite of vulnerability, right? Like the more I can just cover myself yeah. with armor, the less vulnerable I'll be. Right. And yet he finds this little being, which is an innocent little baby, that's like the little baby Yoda that everyone talks about, mm -hmm. and suddenly he care for it. Like it's this thing that has superpowers. And it's like, I don't know if this is a, and I'm in my dream last night going, is this a metaphor for being a father? Because I'm a father of a little boy. And I'm like thinking about one of the most vulnerable things that's ever happened to me is just bringing a child into this world. You know, people talk about having your heart on the outside. And yet it's also a metaphor for this guy that's buried himself and his entire species and their code of not even showing your face because you've got to keep your armor on. Yeah. And yet he's got, he's been quested, as he says, with caring for this vulnerable being that has inner superpowers, which are sort of like, you know, almost like his inner feminine, inner child, you know, wanting to be cared for. So I mean, this is all happening in my dream. So I'm very much uh, um, interested in this shift uh, that's being explored culturally. So I would say like, you know, the whole, our entire culture is dealing with what's wrong with dominance, what's wrong with patriarchy and how can we move into something healthier? Yeah. Hundred percent stuff there. Sorry, but I'm I'm going without notes today, as I said. So I'm just vamping with you. Um, and Esther, another favorite quote from her um, event was: "Boys are taught at a young age what emotions are acceptable, meaning masculine, patriarchal, and which show weakness and are associated with femininity. The code of masculinity, stoicism, strength, power, aggression." not just men internalize it, women too. Under this code, men are allowed two feelings only, anger and lust. Um, and so when I think about one of the most damaging things about patriarchy is like, if you think of like a buffet of amazing food, it's like you're limited to like an appetizer and an entree, um, you know, versus the whole spectrum of experiences. Yeah, men just get steak and beer. Um, uh, no, I absolutely agree with that. I mean, I think if you really break it down, men are a lot of few other things like pride, you know, and and contentment. Yeah. Uh, and but I would say contentment, not even happiness, right? Because right. or maybe happiness, but if as long as it's not joy, right? Because joy, like you're getting a little, you know, light in the lows, right? Mm -hmm. God knows. You know, and I when I began to write about this, I was I was I was sort of like exploring what are the archetypes of like men who are limited to this, these emotional expressions. Because if you look at sort of the alpha male movies and the alpha male movie stars, I'm like Jason Statham, right? And I was Googling, I was realizing it's so rare to see Jason Statham smile in a movie. Because even smiling broadly right. is like a feminine thing. Like in certain cultures, it's weird, like men are not, you know, expected to smile. And and so, uh, yeah, but I couldn't agree more with what Esther says in, in essence. Um, and it's not just emotions, it's, it's uh, you could call qualities, right? Sensitivity is feminine. Yeah. Uh, supportiveness is feminine. Intuition is feminine. Mm -hmm. And so we're not only limited in our emotions, and she's absolutely right. I think she homed in on, on anger and lust because in relationship, especially, um, those are the things that all of the men's stuff gets channeled into. So if you're sad, you know, you, it gets turned into anger. Right. If you're, you know, if you're af afraid or feeling anger. apprehensive, it turns it. Yeah, <laughs> you know, you don't, you don't understand what I have to deal with on a daily basis. You know, right. what he's trying to say is, I'm worried that I'm going to lose my job and not be able to, you know, live up to this manly expectation to provide. But it, it turns into, yeah. you think you're so, you know, you got an easy life here, and I'm, you know, yeah. so yeah. That's true, and and um, you know, and it starts in in childhood, and, and a lot of my my interest in in this work is, I have a question here. It's like, and one of the things I loved about what Esther said in in the uh, intro to that um, masculinity uh, event was sometimes we have it's not just about having the answers; it's about starting a dialogue, you know, where we can just live with the questions a little bit. So, I, of course, I have thoughts uh, that I've come to. But I also have some questions. So one of these questions for me is, given that we have this limited buffet, right? Um, clearly, uh, an obvious answer is, well, we need to help uh, educate our young men and even grown men to understand that these things that have been classically called feminine are actually healthy for men and women, right? It doesn't mean that we have to sacrifice 
our assertiveness and our strength and our rationality in order to develop intuition right. and sensitivity and vulnerability. It just means we, we can integrate them. The question is, is the best way to do that by ceasing to identify these things as masculine and feminine, which is one way to go about it, like stop calling intuition and sensitivity feminine and strength masculine, or is the way to go to, to help us, uh, to help each other understand that men and women all encompass masculine and feminine. It doesn't mean male and female. So that if men get more comfortable, like saying, and being, you know, feeling good about, oh yes, my previously underdeveloped feminine is now in full swing, right? Either way would work. But I, but I feel like there's some, or maybe it's, maybe it's both, but like we can't, we can't have the stigma attached to feminine things that's, that's negative for men, nor to women, right? When women are called bossy, right? That means that you're attaching a negativity to a woman embracing a so-called male trait of assertiveness. So it goes yeah. both ways. But I wonder what people feel about that. Or should we should we trash masculine and feminine in these in this terminology, or should we embrace it in the spirit of yin yang? We're all both. I don't know. Uh, someone just wrote, "Everyone masculine and feminine needs to integrate and balance their human qualities." I tend right. to agree. I think it, it's a little bit of a tricky situation because a lot of the Eastern um, philosophies use the word, and so we're perpetuating it like as a way to honor these like long-standing philosophies that have really rich histories and we have a we have a ton that we can learn from them uh, but perhaps in using like some antiquated language it's just perpetuating this um this challenge that we're trying to overcome yeah that's the dilemma and i think if we sometimes it's we if we work at both angles of it you know maybe we don't need an answer right now i know that in my own work i try to among my male front friends among female friends in relationship I try to talk about being comfortable with so-called feminine aspects, but I always say so-called so or traditionally. Yeah. I don't, you know, so I don't, it's like, I'm trying to do both things. I'm trying to say, you know, why, why is this called, why is this called feminine? Why is this called masculine? But I'm also trying to say, I'm comfortable with masculine and feminine. We need to get comfortable with that. So, you know, maybe we just sort of try everything until it sort of pans out organically. Yeah. Um, it's funny, I just, um, my eyes just fell on, on another quote from Esther's event where she said, we all have elements to our identities that are chosen and other elements that are assigned and prescribed by culture. They're scripts. And we're constantly straddling the line between choice and culture's mandate. Um, and so it's this idea of there is so much that unconsciously has been put on us. And I think Part of the journey is to identify, okay, what is me and what is culture and what of culture do I actually like and want to like uh, consciously choose and what like do I actually want to discard? That's a really, that's a boy, that's a, that's a, <clears throat> that's a Pandora's box right there of deep discussion because what's essentially she's talking about is freedom, right? What parts of me Choice implies freedom, right? If I've chosen to do this or embody this, then I, it's a free thing. And if I'm a certain way because my family taught me this mentality and that's how I just took, you know, inherited it, we've always been Republican, whatever, and that's not free. And so the implied, the implication here is that we want to be free, right? We don't want to be defined by our culture, by our families. And yet there are so many um, influences that would make us unfree. We have the, the the social mores of the country that we grew up in, right? So, for example, um, social mores about masculinity are different in Israel than they are right. here. You might see two men walking hand in hand in Israel and think, "Oh, it's so wonderful that gay men get to be openly appreciated." And but they might not be gay men. They might be straight men holding hands because that's cool there, right. you know. I literally have noticed a difference between my East Coast male friends and my West Coast male friends. My East Coast male friends, when I haven't seen them in a while and I go to hug them, I get this very stiff, you know, pat on the back side of hugs and all my sort of yoga bros from LA, I'll, I, if I haven't seen them in three days, they're like, hey, you know, warm hugs. So there's cultural differences even from one coast yeah. to another. And that's just one piece of the pie. We have our astrological disposition uh, which Paramahansa very wonderfully wrote about in uh, in his autobiograph autobiography of a yogi. Uh, there's the, the chapter on uh, on astrology is 
called Outwitting the Stars. And in essence, what he says is, you're, you have an astrological disposition, but that doesn't just mean this is the asshole that I'm born to be. It means that's your challenge, right? So all of these elements of, you know, cultural inheritance and, in, you know, um, ancestral family stuff and our just weird temperaments, these are all things that we have the opportunity to find freedom in, but it takes work. And I think this is what everybody's getting at. Like, the more conscious we become of what have I inherited, what has been programmed into me socially, et cetera, et cetera, the more I can sort of begin to dismantle it. Because the element, the only thing I would add to what she said is, there are things that we choose, but the choice of them might be informed by the programming that we've inherited. So we right. think, oh, I was free to like this, but in fact, I only like this particular you know, type of movie or this political candidate because that was already programmed into me. So to get to actual freedom takes a, a real lot of, uh, I think, deep meditative uh, conscious work and also relational work. Yeah. And on the topic of deep work, should we segue to the Will Smith conversation? Absolutely. I love that thing. And if that's where you want, I'm, I'm riding your train. Honey. Okay. Um, so I had posted in the event webpage that we were going to be discussing and touching on this really incredible uh, healing experience that Will Smith initiated with a former co-star of his from the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, um, Janet Huber, who played Aunt Viv. And apparently there was um, a, a really massive rift um, that happened between them that was covered in the video. Um, and I'll try to kind of like for anyone who didn't catch it, and it's totally worth a watch, maybe a couple times if you haven't. Um, but I'll, I'll just kind of like overview what the dynamic was. So Janet was um, Juilliard trained. She was a triple threat. She could sing, she could act, she could dance. And she really, as the stereotype would suggest for anyone who went to Juilliard, wanted professionalism. And, you know, Will was the opposite. He was like from Philly, he was 21. He had, it was like loud and noisy and chaotic. And it was like the Will Smith show. And so that uh, difference created some tension between them. And, um, uh, essentially, the the outcome of that tension was Janet was offered a contract where it was 10 weeks of work and she had exclusivity, so she couldn't work anywhere else. And she had a, a little baby and she had a mortgage and she was the sole breadwinner in her family. Um, bottom line, she turned down the contract and kind of like got blacklisted. Um, she lost her house, her reputation. She said calling a black woman difficult in Hollywood is a kiss of death. Um, her family really became estranged from her. The black community repudiated her. Um, her son got really bullied. Um, people like sent her death threats. Um, basically, Janet said, I serve, I've been serving a 30 year sentence after that. So that was kind of the basis for um, them coming back together and trying to repair. Dan, was there anything I missed or that you wanted to add? No, I th that's a really good summary of it. And it's and, and the interesting thing is your summary reflects the presentation of it on Red Table Talk. But I was, um, I, you know, I, I feel like I was reading a bit between the lines. Uh, and and this, this will play into, I think, things that will come up in the conversation about it. But it's interesting that most of that tale about what happened was about what happened to her, right? Like she got, she was, there was tension. She got offered a limited contract. She turned it down. She got blacklisted. She was called difficult. And very much when you see the conversation between the two of them, it's 90% her saying what you did to me, what you did to me, this is what happened. And we hear very little from Will about what his experience of it was. And the, and the, and the, the therapist who is in the Red Table Talk digs into that a little bit, right? She says, you know, you've really gone to, you know, wanting to be accountable and not wanting to be perceived a certain way. But like, let's talk about how that made you feel. There was a lot of stuff coming at you. So I think it's interesting and it's in a way to his credit that he allows the story to stand that way. And, you know, in this entire special, you get very little sense of like what was negative for him in dealing with her. Cause like, it might well be that, sh that she was <laughs> difficult to work with. You know what I mean? Like, things don't happen in a vacuum, but, but he really honored, the, the, the plain truth of it is that he became a superstar and that's what was happening at the moment. And the power imbalance was not just that he was the male star, but he was the star. And she was a woman who had like put all this time into her craft 
and maybe even thought of it as sort of a sellout to have a TV show, but it was a wonderful blessing for the money. And, you know, but you get into an argument with someone like that who's young and immature and he's going to win because he's coming at, you know, he says one thing, the biggest star at the time, right? This rising star and you, nobody knows who you are. And suddenly she received all of the weight of that. And I think that's what he was realizing. Like, yeah. you know, so, so in a way, yeah, I, I think you got the whole story and I started already unpacking it. So let, let's turn it back to you and see where you want to go with this. Well, what was interesting is Will said, you know, I was 21 and as asleep and unconscious as a human could be. Um, and it's so obvious now that everything was a threat to me. I had a dream and I was a scared little boy. I was so driven by fear and I thought you hated me. I didn't realize the power of my words and how they would affect you. Um, and looking back now, it's obvious that you were having a really hard time. I can see the level of pain and struggle. It was just for you to show up in that environment every day. Um, so yeah, I thought he did a really spectacular job of, um, I had in the past called it holding space, but they referred to it as taking psychological punches, meaning being able to like receive someone else's story when you might have had an entirely different experience and not been aware, uh, you know, aware of what they were going through. And I kind of like that idea of taking psychological punches is kind of interesting. Um, so yeah, I thought he did a really superb job of being able to like, um, hold two truths at the same time, you know, hold his truth that like he was just 21 and we all know what, you know, we're like when we're 21. Um, but that it also had a really um, catastrophic impact on her, you know, career and her life. Yeah. I think there's a, there's a, there's a few things here that really moved me about that. Um, and I do think, I love both of those terms. I'm going to keep saying holding space because I like that one too. Yeah. But taking punches, it's almost like, it's almost like a sub, it's like a rubric, you know, sub, a sub thing under, under holding space because holding space can entail that. Yeah. And, uh, and it's a big part of nonviolent communication. And, and, and what I mean by that is he's, he was willing to hear past the accus the accusatory blaming quality of the things she was saying. And I think they touch upon this later in the conversation. It's funny because when you first sent me the link, I saw, it was late at night and I watched the first half of it. And I went to bed thinking, oh my God, I hope this isn't so one-sided and they're not gonna address this weird one-sidedness. Yeah. Because he seems to be taking these punches and then they did address it afterwards. But it was a beautiful thing because he, he was uh, in the spirit of nonviolent communication trying to hear the, the feelings behind the attacks. So what other people were trained as men, especially when someone come at us with a, a, a blame, like you did this to me and why did you do it? Our, our initial reaction is like, whoa, I didn't do anything to you. You did this to me, right? Like the typical male response would be to say, oh no, 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 or, we're, it's, or it's gonna go down now. I'm gonna tell you what you did to me. But instead, he not, he didn't, not only did he, uh, allow her to finish and really focus on listening, but the the quality of his listening was such that he 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 filtered out the accusation and the blame and the attack and got to she's in pain and something I did caused her pain and he was able to connect with that and he starts crying because he's like he's so far past like trying to respond to attack and goes right into this person is expressing her pain as best she can in this yeah. moment and she's finding her words and that was very powerful and i think that speaks to a really important quality in relationship that actually rudolf steiner talks about in uh, i think it's uh, knowledge of higher worlds if we are able to cultivate the ability to listen to someone particularly someone who might disagree with us about something or even be attacking us and enter so deeply into their point of view that we almost make it our own, right? We clear our own crap out of the way just enough to take it in, then we really have the capacity to connect with them in a deeper way. We're just sort of like deflecting the attack and kind of like trying to yeah. plan the next thing we're gonna say when they're done speaking. It's just completely fruitless, you know? Yeah, it's a really Jedi move. Um, I was super impressed. And it's funny too, because I had kind of a similar experience recently um, where a very close friend of mine um, experienced a lot of hurt and pain and I think feeling like betrayed um, in something that I was involved with. 
And it really felt to me like she made it my fault versus um, like kind of owning her own role in feeling what she did. Um, maybe I'm not explaining this well, but I definitely didn't go to the place that Will did. Um, I wouldn't say that I got defensive, but I definitely tried to explain how I experienced the situation, which was very much seen as like defending myself and not receiving her experience. Um, and we're still kind of working through it. Um, it's really hard. It's a, yes, it's a it really, and you know, don't fault yourself for that. It's, it's a, I mean, he did, and we also don't know, I'm not taking away from what he did. You know, they walked off set. There might've been a moment where he's, you know, where he shared with her what his pain was, but, but I think it's very genuine, um, ultimately what happened there. And that comes from a, a lot of practice. And I know he was probably really invested because I don't think he's the kind of person that has a lot of those skeletons in his closet. I think the way it seemed to be presented was like, this was like this one thing that, that had sort of grown to be more and more cancerous, like an, un, an unhealed thing that just got worse and worse and worse. Um, but we all deal with those situations, Leah, like, you know, it's a constant practice to try to balance, because you also don't wanna, you wanna be, there's a surrender involved in just like letting someone blame you, you know, or, uh, and, 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 it, and it, on some level, you also want to speak your truth in a way that's sensitive and loving and not defensive, but are you doing a disservice by not sharing your point? If you're just going to walk on eggshells and, can't, can't, you know, completely handle people with, with kid gloves, I don't think that that's the solution, really. I don't think, I think the Jedi move is, is, is particular to the moment, to the moment of letting her speak, right? Letting her get all this anger off her chest, right? And who knows what kind of conversations they've had subsequently. And frankly, sometimes letting that person have that space leads them down the road to a place where they can hold space for you, yeah. right? And so that that sometimes is, but it doesn't mean you have to completely relinquish your point of view and your truth in it. It just yeah. sometimes, it's, it's about having the strength. It's like taking the high road in a way. The stronger person has to create the container sometimes for the first thing to happen, to be the first listener, you know, yeah. and let them pour it out. Because, because then sometimes, whether it's spoken or not, there's an acknowledgement. I, and I had stuff like that with my stepfather where I never really heard of an apology. But I think once I started giving real forgiveness, um, magical things happened with him and I've had that experience too, but you know, so I don't think you have to completely undermine or, or fault yourself for not getting there right away. It can be a complicated process, especially if someone's coming at you, you know? Yeah. It's hard. Yeah. Yeah. And it was hard to know, was she coming to me as a friend who had an experience or as the leader of something that she was a participant in? And if it's like, as a friend, that's a very different experience of like holding space. And if it's like um, you like you're accountable for doing something in a leadership capacity that I was a participant in, then th then that's kind of like a different dynamic too. Um, especially when she and I had a disagreement about um, a about the fact that something wrong was done um, in the first place. So it's it's sticky. None of this stuff is easy, and we're all like learning as we go. Um, yeah. You're, you are particularly skilled, um, I want to say, at um, showing an openness to different perspectives. I and mean, we don't know each other personally, but from where, from what I've seen in your interactions and how you kind of curate uh, the discussion space, um, I'm not just kissing up here. I really think that you have an ability to um, to, to kind of moderate in your own way, and uh, and I'm sure that's playing in here. And I think. Ultimately, clear and honest uh, and preferably loving communication is always the thing that's going to get you through the stickiness, right? I mean, there's, no, there's not always a clear path, but the torch that lights the way is ultimately communicating clearly and trying to police one's own, like, where am I coming from? Yeah. You know, the most powerful way through, I think. I, I had a situation this morning. I was dealing with a young artist that I was producing, and I had to talk to her her mother, uh, you know, about communication issues. And like, I was really cognizant of 
in what moments I'm speaking as a producer that has an agreement with an artist and in what moments am I speaking to the mother of a human being? And it was 90% that, right? Yeah. This is like with crossover in my careers where like I'm a, you know, a kind of like a spiritual self-development person and counselor and I'm also a producer and very often they overlap. And so I think the, the awareness of like, just that there are different dynamics at play is is already a little bit of a Jedi skill. Like you're, you're tracking, is she talking to me as a friend or in a business capacity? And like, yeah. where is she getting muddled? And where yeah. might I get muddled? Because then you can be aware of that stuff and kind of uh, nip it in the bud a little bit. Yeah, 100%. It, it's funny though, because just watching this and then rewatching it, I did um, extract some nuggets that, you know, when we try to come together and do this again um, and repair, I'll take with me. And one of them is about listening. And Will said, the three most important parts of listening. Number one, let them complete their story without debate. Um, number two, ask questions about their story. And then number three, after they tell you their story, it's still not your turn. Validate it back with empathy. Yeah, that's a big, that, honestly, I, I have to imagine that he's done some study of nonviolent communication because yeah. those are all, you know, part of that approach. Yeah. Empathy is a big part of it. The listening has to do with, I don't want to turn this into promotion for nonviolent communication, but it's been very useful in my own work. And so it's like hard not to recognize it. The listening in particular ways in nonviolent communication, I think it's called listening with uh, giraffe ears. Apparently the giraffe has the biggest heart of uh, land mammals. And so if you're like, have your giraffe ears on, you're like, your heart is as big and open as possible. Um, but the empathy is the empathy is key. So because if you're just sitting there listening and letting someone tell the story and then you're like, OK, now I'm going to tell you how it really is. <laughs> you, you're still leaving them hanging. You know, they yeah. want to hear. And it's so but it's magical. It's not just like we have to stop looking at it as this is a technique. You know, like the, my technique is I need to validate it now. Like that is the good bullet point. But the practice of it is when you actually give of yourself like we have the capacity as human beings to be to be miniature suns, right? Like a sun, like the sunshine, right? We have, we, as I said earlier, we're all kind of walking wounded, but we're also like these angelic beings kind of waiting to radiate love at each other. And we long to that in our real true deepest selves. I think that's what we're longing to do. And so a gesture like um, showing real empathy, not just because it's the thing I'm supposed to do after I listen, but really entering into the person's space and 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 the that kind of form of listening where you really put your ego out of the way and take it in is the is the way in, then something really magical happens when you genuinely show empathy because people can tell. You know, it's like kids can tell if you're lying to them. Even a two-year-old can tell if you're messing with them. Right. But if you really give of yourself and you say, I understand how that hurt you. You know, he said a few things, I think. Um, there were a few moments where it just like shifted her entire being just to have that gift. And then when you feel your power to do that, you're like, holy crap. There's like some, we're dealing with real spiritual alchemy here, of changing vibrations and, and giving to each other gifts of love. And once you realize that, it, it no longer becomes the technique of the thing I'm supposed to do after I listen. It becomes the thing I can't wait to do because I want to open my heart and I want to open that person's heart. And then I want to have that hug that we see them have, you know? On the West Coast only though. Oh really? Oh yeah, exactly, right. <laughs> not not on the West Coast stuff. On the back, you know, maybe a British little handshake, you know, very nice to connect with you. Yeah. So yeah. I think that, I think there's a real beauty and magic there. And, you know, it's, I think these things are useful as points. And I mean, I'm talking about points and techniques and statistics, but when it's sort of like important to kind of humanize what's really happening there. And I, and I love that you shared that video because it's like, it's the same way to see it versus to read about it in theory. When you see two people doing this, and especially so kind of compassionately and expertly, it becomes real in a way that the theory can't capture it on the page, you know, or in a lecture. Yeah, and I also liked it as an example because, um, you know, in Esther's words that we kicked off this conversation with, you know, she talked about how vulnerability is seen as like feminine and weakness. And I thought it was such a powerful example of how like vulnerability is really like strength and courage and self-mastery. 
Yeah, I, I, and I, you know, we did a we did an Omega Male episode, as you know, because we're there. Um, that was a big. There's a big. I think this is helpful for men in that the thing we were talking about earlier, but like how do we reframe the discussion about what's masculine and what's feminine? There's like a transitory period where we might have to like sell to men why things like vulnerability aren't, aren't just feminine. And part of it is um, that vulnerability, when we're talking about vulnerability in personal relationships, we are actually talking uh, about something different than you know what the armor guards you from, right? Because vulnerability in its true sense means open to attack and open to damage. And you, nobody wants that. And nobody would volunteer to be in that. But when you are being vulnerable, you are actually making a choice. And so it, it's actually an act of bravery, mm -hmm. right? So men can get on board with bravery. Men, men are like, oh, I, I'll do bravery because that's some masculine shit. Uh, so let me get in on the bravery. What's the brave thing to do? Oh, open my heart and talk about my pain. Okay, you know? <laughs> Versus someone's telling you for years, you have some guy like my father's father. Don't cry, boy. What are you gonna cry to me now, you sissy? Why don't no. clean up your face and go, you know, like that programming is what tells us that that emotions other than anger and lust are feminine and that vulnerability is some girly stuff, you know? But so many of these qualities are powerful. Forgiveness is powerful. Forgiveness is so misinterpreted to be like you're making a concession, right? right? You did a shitty thing to me, but I'm gonna like, cause I'm a wimp and I'm not gonna fight you anymore. I'm gonna just let it go. No, it's a, it's a, it's a, such a powerful expression, you know, and a beautiful expression. But the trick is it's not power like in the dominance hierarchy where one person's achievement of power is somebody else's detriment. It's right. a power where everyone benefits. A gesture of love, like forgiveness, like sensitivity, like cooperation, like supporting another person instead of competing with them is a, it's, a, it's like one of these magically self-multiplying things. Like lo love is not a finite resource. And so I think that's, that's really important for men to understand. And, and we don't because the messaging around it is so convoluted and backwards. Yeah. I feel like we can't talk about vulnerability without quoting Brene Brown. So wow. I'll, I'll share a quote from her book, Daring Greatly, which is all about vulnerability. She says, vulnerability is the birthplace of love, belonging, joy, courage, empathy, and creativity. If we want deeper, more meaningful lives, vulnerability is the path. Um, and on that note, so right before we went live, I got a question from a group member. And he said, I feel like you'll like this. He said, hey, I really like that Daniel McKenzie. I can't make the live thing today because of work but I'd be interested in knowing what tangible practice he's seen that get men past their reliance on tough exteriors. I'm really looking for practical techniques. Thanks. I love that. Love that question. Well, to me, there are different fields of working on this. There's the, there's the techniques of working within yourself because there's vulnerability with yourself. There's vulnerability in relationship. I mean, you could say with women, but I want to include everyone who might not be in a relationship with a woman. And there's vulnerability among friends. And there are practical things we can do in all of those realms. Or I'd add a fourth, vulnerability in the world. So like, like what you do, coming on here and talking openly about stuff. I, you know, To me, this is sort of a vulnerability in the world. I'm going to sit here without notes. And I, people might think I'm just some dumb idiot who's a blowhard and doesn't know what he's talking about. And I'm trying to do something good. And I'm also aware of like my ego's investment in wanting to per be perceived as smart or whatever or useful. Um, so that's like vulnerability in the world or like having a child is vulnerability in the world because suddenly I'm vulnerable to like bad stuff that might happen. Um, I think what's particularly useful for men um, in, with each other is uh, recognizing when a sensitive topic or an opportunity to speak vulnerably or be vulnerable comes up and not allow it to just drift into using humor to laugh it off, you know? And, and, and I do this, I have these hikes with my friends who are very vulnerable men, but still we all have carry some of that stuff, you know? And you never hear, some stuff you never hear men say is like, I have a date tomorrow and, and I think it's like, we're probably gonna have sex for the first time and I'm really worried that uh, she's gonna think my dick is too small or that I'm, I'm not gonna perform well, you know? Or like, Guys will never share their their you know their fears with each other, and so if I share something like that, 
sometimes it's jarring, you know, to uh, to a friend, you know, like, I don't like, what if we don't have good chemistry? You know, guys don't talk about things that way. So I think just trying to like be bold yeah. and lead by example, um, I think in relationship, um, being willing to, uh, learning to share vulnerability, particularly in a relationship with a woman who, as you said, they're, they're programmed with their own way of dealing with male vulnerability, learning to, to be open hearted and to express yourself in a vulnerable way without completely falling apart is good. Cause a lot of men who are so locked down in their vulnerability, when it comes out, it's, it comes out like a mess, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. so, um, and uh, you know, I don't want to take too much time answering. I think in the terms of working with yourself, deeply meditatively, if you're willing and silent, deep contemplation to go into what you are, what your real fears are. Cause we have an internal dialogue that doesn't even have to do with other people. And I won't even be honest with myself about what my fears are. I won't even be vulnerable with myself as a man sometimes. Like I really am worried about my career. Like to have that moment with yourself is powerful. So yeah. in all of these realms, there are things we can do and they mostly have to do with being willing to, you're used to going off the, the three meter dot board and you got to go up to the five meter board and, and look off the edge and just step off it yeah. a few times, you know? And you did mention men's groups. You know, we have a women's group um, in the Esther Perel discussion group that meets weekly. Um, I think there is so much power in being part of a safe community where kind of by design vulnerability is the objective. Um, so it's almost like the expectation versus the um, exception. Absolutely. And the only thing I would add to that is, and this is not... Um, Correctively, because I think it's it's a yes and. I think men's groups are powerful, whether they're sort of uh, informal, like me and my hiking buddies, or actual organized men's groups. But I also think that this comfort zone that men have with each other, when there's like, because men will be a little bit more vulnerable if it's like we decide this is a where we're vulnerable. It's in our group. We yeah. might not do it on, the team, but we'll do it in our group. Um, can we get out of the comfort zone and learn to be in a community of men and women? And speak vulnerably. That's a little bit what the you know my omega male thing is about is trying to trying to create a space for men to talk about men's issues, but for women to be present. Not only so that men learn to speak vulnerably in front of other women and share their concerns, which we're not used to doing. Like that's just an it's an expansion. You know, it's sort of like a different class in college. Yeah. One class is be super vulnerable as men, and the other class is let's open up to all human beings and be vulnerable yeah. in that way that's useful too. Yeah. Um, oh, there was one more thing I was going to add. You mentioned the men's group. Oh, um, just like yet yeah, the idea of exposure therapy, like every day doing, there was that book um, called Rejection Proof, where there was a guy, he got rejected and it was like really jarring for him. And he did this 100 day rejection challenge. And it's like exposure therapy. And you can do the same thing every day doing one small thing. It doesn't have to be like a big thing, like talking about, you know, being afraid of a date and performance anxiety, but it could be like striking up the conversation in the elevator and making eye contact where, um, yeah, it's becoming a part of like your daily practice. Absolutely. And, 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 and this is where I think the individual work comes in because it's really helpful uh, to identify where your areas of, vulnerability are you know like when it comes to talking about you know family issues or when it comes to talking about uh, you know um sharing my fears everyone has a particular it's not just there's one thing called vulnerability you know like um some people might feel self-conscious about their career aspirations and fears other people might feel conscious self-conscious about sexual issues yeah. um so knowing what your challenges are and working on those specifically, I think is helpful. And you just like, I mean, I hate to be a cliche, but it's sometimes it's baby steps. It's like, just dip your toe in the water a little, you know? Yeah, yeah, I've, I noticed, yeah I've, I've really noticed that with the group because um, I started it just over three years ago. And I would say, um, you know, before that, like people would say like, Leah, you're kind of hard to read. Um, I think I had some masks up 
Um, but the group has been like the best exposure therapy because I'm just so used to talking. I mean, it was a baby steps process, but now I'm just, I don't think there's anything that I wouldn't talk about or like haven't talked about, you know, because it's been, I'm just so used to it now and it's just really comfortable. You're living my theory. That, and, and I apologize for mispronouncing your name because I've now oh. heard you say it yourself. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, you're living my theory that vulnerability in a sense is a uh, a stepping stone to invulnerability not that invul but in a new kind of invulnerability the invulnerability invulnerability that we are inheriting the sort of masculine protect yourself with the armor and the best scar that's the old invul like trying to protect yourself from the attack right. new vulnerability is having nothing to defend right so you you related this experience of you know, the more I put myself out there, the more comfortable I get. Yeah. And that's what happens. So it's not like I'm comfortable being vulnerable. Like the more you go out in front of the crowd and risk, you know, whatever your stage fright and your humiliation, at some point you just go, oh, I don't, I don't care if I fail or like failure is this mystical thing, you know, it's not going to end me. And so in a way it's, uh, you're, you know, I mean, it's natural. I think to always have a new threshold for vulnerability yeah. and it's good to do those, but but in a way you end up having less and less and less to protect and defend. Yeah. And so this combination of the inner work of knowing what you're protecting and what your wound is yeah. and the outer work of exercising it and trying little by little to expose yourself, um, it ends up leading to a place where you're like, you got nothing to hide, nothing to defend, and, and that's a wonderful free space. Yeah. And that's when you're talking about freedom and becoming who you really are, choose to be versus who you've been molded to be. Yeah, 100%. I think that's a good note to end on. Free to be. Yeah, all right. I like it. That was actually the name of a course that I did with Dr. Shafali Sabari. Do you know her? I don't think I do, but now that you're mentioning the name, you might oh, I do. You might have seen an interview with her. She's done like the, the Lewis Howes, um, Tom Bilyeu Impact Theory Circuit. Um, and she's one of my favorite. You know, there's like a stair. Dr. Shafali and the woman. Oh yeah, that sort of like strikingly beautiful Indian woman. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hate uh, to refer to her physical characteristics, but because she's she's absolutely brilliant. But when I first, it was like that typical programming. I was like, like who's this? Like you know what I mean? Like it's sort of like male stuff. I recognize in myself. Someone shared a video. I'm like, oh, she, this was this gorgeous woman. She can't possibly <laughs> be. You know? And then you're like, oh my god, this woman is enlightened. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, yeah, so thank you. I, I remember her, the, her first name was familiar. She's, she's everything I've seen from her has been brilliant. Yeah, I've done, I, mean, I can't even keep track of how many hundreds of hours of courses. She's really into meditation. So she has meditation courses, um, like self actualization courses, consciousness. Um, but she had mm -hmm. a relationship course that I mm -hmm. did, and it was called Free to Be. Um, so well, I, and on Free to Be. Um, I love it. Thank you so much, Daniel. I just saw a note. Someone said, I have a question if it isn't too late. Um, how does one partner try to invite or inspire their male partner to open up and be more vulnerable? He seems very closed up with protective armor. Is this even possible? That's a that's a big question and, and and given that we're running out of time um I, I'd, I'd be if that you know person wants to pm me or something yeah. uh, that'd be great but I, but i would say um it's always the most effective thing i think to do is to to lead by example and, and if you are if you make yourself vulnerable, rather than saying you're never vulnerable with me i want to know what you're feeling and what you're thinking is never going to work as much as like these are my fears and this is this is how I feel, and I'm I'm longing to know what you feel about this. You know, I think it would be so validating for me to just know one way, like you know, pick something that you really want him to share about, and you know, create an inviting space. As Leah was saying, find a way to hold space and and invite it energetically more than verbally. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe you know, it's a combination, but to like find out what makes him comfortable. When is he more likely to share? Probably not in the middle of an argument, you know what I mean? If you're having a walk in the in the woods somewhere and he seems to be really warming up, like, and you share something really vulnerable, that's, those are the, the opportunities, you know? And if you can also create them too, you don't have to wait till you're 
taking a walk. But I think leading by example and creating an energetic s space and a container for it is most likely to be welcomed. Yeah. Right? And I would just encourage the person who asked that. I actually can't see who asked because of the technology we're using, but whoever asked that, post it as a separate thread, a separate question, and maybe invite people if they have any good video examples that model that happening in a dynamic or any other content that would be helpful to post it in the comments, because I'd be interesting, interested to see. Um, Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Daniel, for your time. And you're a group member, so people can catch you in the group and tag you in the group. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah, welcome, welcome anyone to friend me, tag me. I love participating on the threads. There's so much wonderful, valuable uh, conversation going on. And I want to thank you, Leah, not just for inviting me into this conversation, but for doing such a beautiful job kind of curating that space. And uh, constantly bringing new content and new uh, exciting questions it's been really it's been fun actually you know, one wonderful space to connect with people love that fun is a good thing yeah. uh, i did a workout earlier today and my trainer he's a very spiritual person so he always um wants us to share one thing that we're grateful for in the chat because it's all virtual and then um how we want to show up in the world today um, and I think he um, was having kind of a rough week. He's exploring his sexuality and exploring dating men. And um, he um, like took a trip to, to meet a guy that he'd been chatting with who was long distance. And it, I think he had like really high expectations. And I think it was maybe his first time connecting with a man romantically. And I don't think it went quite as he had hoped. And so he was kind of like having a rough week. And so he set an intention for the day to be for it to be fun, happy, and connected, um, FHC. And so he encouraged all of us to like tap into that energy today too. So fun was part of that <laughs> energetic experience. Yeah, yeah, my heart goes out to him. That's, that's, a, that's a challenging thing, especially if somebody, if he's been living, I'm, I'm presuming that he's been living sort of heterosexually, if you're saying he's just, ex, you know, um, because he's not only dealing with exploring his own sexuality, he's dealing with exploring his own sexuality in a context that is the most socially frowned upon and prohibited. There's like somehow, women generally, generally get a pretty crappy deal in our patriarchal society, but but like women's sexual fluidity is a little more socially acceptable than it is for men. Like men can deal with gay, you know, but like a guy who was like with women and now wants to experiment a little bit, like that's like, that's a really, that's uncharted territory. So I, I would encourage him to not be dismayed by this first experience and not be dismayed by all the messaging he's getting from an unsupportive culture. And uh, I'm sure other good things will happen for him if he just keeps on going. Yeah, he's doing great. And he's got a great supportive community behind him too. Right. So, uh, well, thanks again. Um, whoever the group member was, post your question as a separate thread. And um, someone else asked about sharing this. Um, I am happy to turn this into a YouTube video that's shareable. Um, if you try to share this video because it's, it's within a group, you're not gonna be able to share it. It'll just show up as like content unavailable. So we'll put it on YouTube and um, I'll share that link as soon as it's live. Okay. Fantastic. Thanks. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you, Leah. Thanks everyone. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks, Daniel. And um, we'll catch you in the group soon. Bye, everyone. Awesome.